You found your map. I found it. I just need reminded where Babylonia is every once oh, in a while. Yeah. Yeah. Elam. Elam, yeah. So show me a man who can point to Elam on a map. <laughs> <laughs> What's cool about Elam is uh, they kind of, they were the foundation for Persia in a really weird way. The Persians conquered them right as kind of Mesopotamia was uh, running its last course. Huh. The Assyrians destroyed Elam, this capital city of Susa. Uh, Ashurbanipal was very proud of that. Huh. Re- kind of ruined it, but then the Persians moved in and it civilized them. They, the Persians were more like steppe nomads. They, they actually All right. Came, and then they move into Ekabatana. This is one of those instances, I can't remember if we were talking yeah. about it before or not, but where the, uh, where the conquering yeah. force actually gets... Assimilated, assimilated to the and right and interesting then, strangely enough you know a couple thousand two thousand years later the turks who are not related to the persians conquer persia mm-hmm. become civilized <laughs> this similar process. well i'll be darned i didn't know that huh? yeah so i wonder if the turks borrowed anything from elam all those years later that's con- well that's continuity <laughs> yeah, right? yeah that's the nature of it because they, they did i mean you had they were, they were using cuneiform up until like 100 AD you know, huh. in like as a ritual. You know, nobody could read it. Nobody used it on a practical level, but you still kind of had to. Really? The, well, even the people making it didn't know what the, they were. Was it just sort of like, OK, right, they would, right. They like would the have, scribes. Yeah, it would have, and it would have been like three guys who were history buffs at the time. Like, oh, that's all the Cadian, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> right. It'd be, the same way with, <laughs> do, does the, the average... Catholic priests speak Latin. No, that's what I was going to say. It's yeah. the same thing with the Latin and the Catholic Church. Yes. Right. And, and probably Greek in the Orthodox Church, or is it, does it they, go that they way? They actually speak it, don't they? <laughs> in the liturgy? I mean, parts of the liturgy sort of have little little sections, but nothing. No, 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 None of the people in my parish that weren't Greek could speak Greek, I don't think. Okay. Yeah. I mean, some of our kids actually studied it, you know. Okay. But I think that was just sort of, oh, I should learn Greek because... It's related to my, you know, yeah. sure. faith tradition or sure. whatever. Sure. Yeah, so it's that's... just knowing cuneiform, being one of three guys in your, <laughs> in your, in your yeah. civilization or your city or whatever. Well, it's to be like me. It's like how I want to learn uh, Esperanto. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like it's gonna do no good. Yeah. Or oh, it would be fun to learn Morse code. Right. Yeah. For what? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, and that's. I mean, that's how it. Because even then. Like after in the year zero, Sumer, nobody remembers the Sumerians at all. It, it, it's the the same way because it was two thousand years before. Then. Uh, does any nobody remembers the Romans? It's a story we tell. Yeah. Sure. We have an idea in our. It was this. It was the exact same for them. Like, oh hmm. yeah, they had a big civil. Oh look at that mound. You know that old ziggurat decaying away into the mud. Well, the city of Rome is decaying away. Yeah. All right. <laughs> We don't actually want to rebuild the Colosseum or keep it up. It's a museum, right? Or, or, or like the the stories of sort of the uh, legendary yeah. uh, foundational Chinese dynasties. Yeah. It's like, oh, they were like this, but yeah. really, there's not a lot. Well, I mean, the myth or the story I got when I was raised: the Romans gave us law, the Greeks gave us philosophy and democracy, sure, and we ended up with this grand, grand European. Yeah. White male dominated. Yeah. I mean, I mean that was really the story I got. Yeah, hmm. yeah. yeah. It's a, and it's just a straight shot. shot. It, it was, it was it, somehow this inevitable, inexorable right. uh, product of history leading to the Western white males. I mean, that's basically how I ended up understanding it. Yeah, that's the grand. Once narrative. I grew up, that's yeah, what they mean, yeah. Basically. Right. That's just the mandate of heaven, right? Yeah, in it a is. way. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, and I mean, oh boy. Here we are again, <laughs> talking about continuity of the West versus continuity of China. Yeah. Like I would say, there is a difference between those two things. Like our narrative, the continuity was broken. We are not Roman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But With the Romans did give us stuff. I'll admit, I, I'll say that fully. But we, in terms of our social values and the way we treat our civilization, we are not Roman. There is no continuity. We are Germanic barbarians well, who adopted certain aspects of Roman. And one, one of the biggest breaks probably came with Martin Luther, wouldn't you think? Uh, I mean, all no. of a sudden, this emphasis on the individual rather oh, than the wow. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, what did he do? He, yeah. he says, it's me that's my relationship with the, yeah. right? And yeah. So that's focus on the individual. And then eventually you get capitalism and individual seeking their, you know, fulfillment. Mm. I don't know. I mean, it seemed to me Luther would be very important. Well, I, I, oh, he's extremely important. I, w- I would say the, um, the, you, 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 but you, what you must do is draw the distinction between post-empire Catholicism and pre-empire Catholicism. Like the, the imperial Roman church under Constantine and, and his, and, you know, di- others were, was very different. Yeah. The, the nature of the religion, it was an imperial, formal state religion. And then when the West disintegrated, it changed. Okay. There was a real change with that. So Martin Luther changed post. Post. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I would say that was when the break the disintegration of the West and the rise of Christendom. But it's to, to, not uh, not judging the validity of the statements, but just this yeah. seems like the the very universal sort of instinct by by people or those in power or those who want to pretend they're in power or whatever to to pretend they're the carriers of some ancient torch, right? Uh-huh. The inheritors of some sort of legitimacy. Yes. Yeah. yeah, all I mean, you never even even during periods of extreme disintegration, like very very dark ages, even even if the formal head of government is nothing more than a warlord sitting in a hut that's slightly bigger than anybody else's hut, uh, even then, the the leadership claims legitimacy. Nobody ever sits down and says, "Might makes right." I'm more powerful. They, they, you know, even the most petty aristocrat says, "No, I, this is my legal right. This is why I have power." Mm. Over you. you can't just—you <laughs> never see it. You know, okay. I, I have the power of a gun. Okay, come back to China. What about the Cultural Revolution and Chairman Mao? Uh, that, that caused a break. Yeah. You know, maybe, but maybe it was only a ninety-eight percent break, and maybe that two percent of China still lives. You know. Yeah. That continuity. Yeah. I would hope. They seem to be bringing it back. Well, that's the that's the fear. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. Um, well, I, I had a friend. I think maybe I told you one of his comments was, "Wish he could live for another two hundred years, so we right then they will have figured out the Cultural Revolution." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, I mean that's how it'll take that long to really understand yeah. what it was about. <clears throat> and I would, it, you see the. It seems to be that there's a rise of nationalism on, among. Not communism, not international socialism, but nationalism among young Chinese people. Yeah. And they're starting to, there's the Han Fu movement of wearing Han dynasty style clothing. Really? Yes. Whoa. Um, and they seem to be embracing ancient imperial dynastic Chinese culture more. Hmm. They're very proud of it. And I would hope that comes back even more, you know, like. In some ways, I'm a communist, but communism plus Chinese culture? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> the world really needs that. Yeah. The world really needs that. They have a lot to give. Yeah. So, yeah, but no, the, the, it is. I mean, the previous talk we had was about continuity versus change. Yeah. Does anything ever appear brand new out of the ground without context or c- cause? No. Well, you know, that was the big debate, intellectual debate in the 60s and 70s was... One of the one of the way one thing that got us started was uh, what's his name? I can't think of his name. The structure of scientific revolutions, <clears throat> and then in even in paleontology between Gould and the others, yeah. these these dramatic changes punctuated punctu- punctuated. I mean that was sort of the intellectual debate yeah. that was. Cult- I mean not just in in broad cultural history terms, but also within say biology. Sure. Yeah. Mm. You know what? It, what? It, what? What? What continues and what is total? What is new? Right. And Gould was on the side of punctuated equilibrium. And I think that was because of his idealism. I mean, his idealism. We can create. We can create a new world. Whereas, E. O. Wilson wrote a book called Human Nature. So yeah. wait, there's there's something here. We're organisms, and his biggest opponent was at Harvard, Gould. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this yeah. was a big mm. debate. Yeah. Got pretty personal. Too. They got pretty personal. Yeah. They attacked Wilson and yeah. yeah. Is it 
I think Wilson said it's evolution by jerks. Yeah. <laughs> referring to Gould's personality. <laughs> well, the, the punctuated equilibrium is the idea that there's long periods of stasis in a, in a gene pool, and then a, an environmental change causes very rapid genetic change. So mm. it's, a, it's a step. So right for speciation especially for we're speciation. talking about here whereas the traditional view and i got to get to the fun <laughs> here too uh -oh. is that you had these populations split the gene pools would evolve differently so you, it was stretched out like that and so that was referred to as evolution by dumbbells <laughs> there you go. Uh, that's my favorite part of these things is when you get the satire and the humor yeah i love it don't love you just it. get the impression that everyone was a lot cleverer back then uh, you it know or way. maybe it's just because what we read are we these men of letters or oh, women of letters you know we, we, but we would allow the idiots it, but it also seems like yeah. you know the people who were sure maybe privileged to lead to, to live in like the upper echelons of society so they had a lot of leisure times so where they were expected to play the piano and yeah. write well but you read these letters from people that aren't known for their writing or even compositions on the piano yeah. who are not famous yeah. composers yeah. and they're like oh wow that yeah. person's a better pianist than i am yeah. and they're just a socialite yeah. Yeah. you know they're yeah. famous for something else oh I, yeah it's they just knew how to write letters back then. I tell you yeah. what. It's, it, what's incredible, like, some of the, you, you read about, like, an, an Italian princess in the duchy of, you know, Gon Montferrat, and it's like, she spoke eight languages. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but she also... She's not a scholar. She's, she's not, not an academic, yeah, you know, she's she, not... She, and it's like, but she also believed in ghosts. Right. Yeah. It's so cool. <laughs> in fact, that was one of the eight languages. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she could speak to the ghosts. Yeah. yeah. yeah and uh, it's, so it's incredible. They're sitting there, and like, a lot of... The amount of they they're more traveled than I am. You know, yeah. they've been all over the Mediterranean or something. Yeah. And they've they've had seven children by the time they're twenty one, and and the, and yet they also yeah, yeah. I don't feel good. I need to be bled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, it's funny to. What are they? It, uh, yeah, that's a that's a good reminder. It's yeah. funny, you know, you watch these historical TV shows or whatever, and you know, it's like some com what is it, what's the comedy of manners or whatever that term for that genre is but you know you're watching these you know some aristocrats. Arist victorian aristocrats and they look so fancy and they're traveling all over and they're, yeah. they're so rich and get to eat set, but then you realize like the way they have to shit and <laughs> and, and you know when they get yeah. when they get a cold or whatever yeah, the chamber like, the chamber pot yeah, and yeah, yeah the whole yeah. thing sure yeah. yeah so no yeah on some of that looks nice but yeah. on the other on the other yeah. hand my you know relative labor yeah. You know, I've got a lot on them. You still. know how to brush your teeth. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Maybe taking a bath is okay. It's good for you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. people right. didn't believe in bathing. They didn't. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. The, when the Native Americans, when the Europeans first encountered Native Americans, the natives were like, oh, <laughs> you people are disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> because they were very, it was a, their societies overall, you know, they were cleaner. Cleaner. Just straight yeah. up, they would bathe all the time. Yeah. They would clean their teeth and they didn't have as many diseases and they were like why do you blow your mucus into a cloth and then yeah. put it in your pocket as if it's something precious <laughs> <laughs> don't want to lose that yeah like what is wrong with it's you? even embroidered oh. with my initials yeah, yeah. like <laughs> the native americans were just appalled at these reeking <laughs> hairy <Yeah. laughs> disgusting monstrous violent people <laughs> Jeez. well i think that you know like satire i love satire it's my favorite kind of favorite kind of humor sure because it makes you think mm -hmm. like a pun a good pun is like a good poem it makes you think yeah. right because yeah. you have to do it but satire you know these people have been around but i think you're right it's a privilege to her. well no not just the privilege when you hear some of the humor that comes out of the so-called lower classes mm -hmm. that's pretty funny mm -hmm. i mean mostly say, really funny sayings we have that's probably where they came from really i mean yeah. so, you know. well they were i mean we lit it was a face-to-face -face society yeah. you know all you had was your reputation yeah. you probably didn't know how to write yeah so yeah well, that area has to remind me. Hmm. It, it, when you talk about this, I'm sorry, but i got to talk yeah. about this. Oliver Goldsmith is one of my favorite char characters in Western literature. Oh, he wrote Vicar of Wayfield and, and uh, this, uh, 
she stoops to concert. Anyway, he was part of that intellectual group in London, an expatriate from England. And these oh. people, I mean, they were smart and they sure. did things. And the, I read a biography of Oliver Goldsmith written by Washington Irving. Oh. Washington Irving. And this, what I read, I have a book that was published in 1840-something, which is a reprint of Oliver Goldsmith's History of Animated Nature. Okay. And he stole everything from the French, what he wrote about the French. <laughs> I mean, just apparently what he did. But one, Irving has this talk, he has this biography. It's a pretty long one. And he gets to this point right after his death. This one guy, he says, this really bad guy, I forget his name now, wrote this epitaph for Goldsmith by his own hand who justly died a blundering, artless suicide. Share earthworm share since now he's dead. His magrin, maggot bitten head. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> well, uh, Irving thinks that was serious. The guy might not have liked Oliver, but I think that's probably what these guys did. Right. I yeah. mean, make these clever jokes about each other, mm-hmm. just like yeah. the dumbbell and the sure. evolution yeah. by jerks. What else you do know? you have to do anyway? Yeah. <laughs> that, that was posting. That was being extremely yeah. online and being on Twitter. You know? Yeah. <laughs> just, I'll write a clever thing to the. Yeah. <laughs> I'll you know. insult you through your face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, it's. It, I, I, I think nostalgia is a very bad thing to do. Yeah, it, dangerous. It's, it's dangerous, and it's it's such a betrayal of human potential. Yeah. You know, like, so, I think part of the reason we've seen such a hard transition recently is because of the technological transition. Yeah. Know? And so, like, yeah, Twitter sucks, but people are going to get good at it. And genuinely good at it, you know. But it's part of the reason it sucks is because it's brand new. It's just yeah. everybody gets on there and you haven't had the time. Yeah. But, you know, th- th- I'm sure there were people who lamented the printing press. Oh, they did? <laughs> yeah. Oh, they did? Oh, sure. there's too many books. Yeah. Too, everybody writes a pamphlet now. Yeah. Everybody, all, all these shitty people who don't know how yeah. to write are now yeah. writing books. Yeah. Mm. It was better when you had to do it by hand. Right. Because that winnowed out right. the lazy people. I yeah. bet they don't even know how to pulp and press their own yeah. paper. Yeah. And here I spend all this time <laughs> learning how to bind my own books in addition yeah. to writing them. Or yeah. What, you know. yeah. 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 So yeah. I, I, I think. I, I've cultivated good relationships with the bookbinders in my town for so long. Yeah. Yeah. All for and, not. And now some snot-nosed 16-year-old can sit there and that's write a right. treatise. That's right. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, you know, it's funny. On a personal note, that's how I feel about um, people who uh, are using uh, electronic means of making music. Oh, yeah. You know, sure. whether it be garage band or something, yeah. you know, professional. Or It's like they sit around and they, they click around. They learn the software. They yeah. follow their ear. They watch YouTube videos. And they create you know if at least sometimes mediocre if not actually interesting music sure. and probably a half you know not I'm not trying to be elitist here yeah. but some of them have less experience yeah, studying sure. <laughs> the, the ancient craft of how to put chords together yeah, you yeah, know yeah, yeah. but now it's sort of moot i mean it's nice to know yeah. it's always better to know yeah. it is but yeah. you know there's a yeah, and that's that's a person well, that's a personal aside sorry there, there's but nothing but, wrong with elitism yeah. There's nothing wrong with <clears throat> work doing the work to become elite. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with I that. agree. Yeah. I agree. And I think China has recognized that. I mean, that's a recognized part of Chinese culture. The oh, emphasis yeah. on education and these people that could write poetry as well as be great administrators. They're yeah. worshipped. I mean, they have museums for these people. Yeah. I think that's a really, uh, to, <clears throat> to, get, uh, to bring it back to the West versus China, uh, yeah, and they've been doing that for so long. For long, they yeah. ser- they take their elites seriously, and the elites take their obligation to the common people, and to ch- even more important than the common people who happen to be alive now, they take their duty towards Chinese civilization very, very seriously. Mm-hmm. Like they will die for it. Mm-hmm. They will die for China. Mm-hmm. They will devote all of their lives yeah. and all of their expertise and art to China. Yeah, it's really something. Yeah. It, Sushi. Uh, oh my God! I, you, well, you, uh, uh, Dufu. Dufu. Yeah. Li Bai. Li Bai. Bai Ju Yi. <laughs> you can go on and on. Just go on and on. And there's a museum for every one of them. Yeah. I mean, there's more than one. In yeah. some cases, I've been to uh, many of those museums. It's yeah. just amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I would. <laughs> if 
if I ever went to China and went to the what the White Deer Academy, that's sushi. The guy who put together the four the Neo Confucian. You know, yeah. I would I would buy a rose and <laughs> put it on his epi, you know his yeah. cenotaph because. Yeah. He's the one that codified the, the yeah. civil exam curriculum. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the four great books. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it, you were telling me about him as we tromped around your garden looking for <laughs> a big spider and then oh, something yeah. else. I can't remember. <laughs> Probably some greens. But yeah. It's funny. Just thinking of it puts me back in the garden. Oh, you know? yeah. Mm. Yeah. We didn't see the spider, unfortunately. No, she had, she had gone. Big, big, beautiful garden spider. Oh, I love them. Yeah. I love them. Yeah. I love spiders. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, I don't know much about Du Fu or Li Bai. Were they? Ex I, I recognize them as poets, but uh, were they examples of poets that were willing to die for well, Chinese they were, civilization? They, they were almost always administrators. And, oh, okay. you know, right, I mean, right. what they did is they the passed the exam, and they'd be, and then you fall out of. Some of them would fall out of favor with the oh, emperor, yeah. and this this sort of thing, and they'd be sent to this distant place yeah. and they couldn't help in the capital where uh, they felt they could help the government do its yeah. best job <laughs> a lot of the poetry is written like that and they, interesting and they had and so not only were they the civil administrators and the artists but they the the imperial exam system and that continuity that community of scholars had real independent power of the emperor they could actually stand up to it like if he was a little shit they could stand up to him mm -hmm. at extreme danger to their health yeah, and wealth, yeah. but they could do but, it. Yeah. He was not he was not a tyrant who could just tell them or dismiss them. Yeah. And so, if, if uh, there was a there was a Ming emperor who wanted to uh, divorce, not divorce, <laughs> to supplant his first wife with a favorite mistress. And the scholars, the, the literati, the, the, the Jin Shur, the pre presented gentlemen, stood up to him and were like, this is immoral. This is not right huh. to do. And it kind of it paralyzed the Ming dynasty at a kind of a crucial point because he got pissed and basically went on strike as emperor. He was like, fine. Well, if you're not going to. If you're not going to go along with me on this decision... If you're not going to bureaucrat, I'm not going to emperor. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. And so for like 15 years, he just kind of futzed around in the in the uh, Forbidden City, didn't do anything, <laughs> and, the, and the government kind of ground him What's off. he supposed to do? Well, he's... What's his job? Well, I mean, he's the son of heaven. Uh, <clears throat> so he, what, he makes proclamations? Yes, but he doesn't... But it's, it was... He, he's, a, he's a religious and bureaucratic figure at the same time like he he wouldn't just make a proclamation uh i don't know if this is the case in the ming dynasty but in the qing dynasty at least at least qianlong and, and the high qing uh there was a type of red ink that only the emperor could use mm. in the world mm -hmm. and so if he made a proclamation he had probably been thinking about it and planning it with his scholar elite bureaucrats mm -hmm. for years year you know but tax reform mm -hmm. land reform declaring war all you know all that crap <laughs> he, so he's a he's a sacred sacral bureaucrat. i'm just trying to figure That's out right. what gets done when the empire stops i mean what doesn't get done right you know it's like right but that's my own prejudice like you know what's uh right what's that guy for you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he was, it's so oh, bad. It's hard because when you had dynamic emperors, armies went on the move. Right, you know? right, like, right. It's incredible. When you had not so dynamic emperors, the local bureaucracy and government just keeps going. Right. Yeah, there's right. no. And, he, and even when you have a dynamic one, it, you barely notice. At the bottom. At the bottom. Things yeah. still. Right. So, and they recognize it. It's very difficult. Like, we go. Us Americans go, oh, if it's not a democracy, then it's a tyranny. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That's a, that is the most hilariously false dichotomy. Yeah. You know, uh, so they understood, a responsible emperor and his administration understood that there was very little they could do at the local level. And the good ones very seriously went, okay, we need to help the common people here. The taxes are getting too great. Well, you know, there's a bad harvest. There's a <clears throat> quake. 
And this is what a lot of their poetry would be about. Yes. This is what they they write, doofu, especially doofu. If, oh, especially Dufu. Yeah. Huh. And uh, I mean, that's what they do. Some the of them are more playful. Yeah. Oh, Interesting. yeah. Sure. Lee, yeah. Lee Bai was famous for being play. He was drunk one time in the presence of the imperial family. They invited him all in, and yeah. they, he would like he would do calligraphy on the spot oh, yeah, and nice. write poems yeah. in calligraphy. Freestyle. Freestyle. That's great. He, now is Lee Bai if he's if he was famous for being drunk. What, is he the one most famous for being yes, the drunken poet? The moon, and the there's wine, something and about yeah, recognizing or mm-hmm. nearly drowning himself, <laughs> trying to. My no, chi- he did drown himself. Yeah. When yeah. I when my first went to China, people would help me understand Du Fu and Li Bai this way. Okay. Li Bai is Mozart. Du Fu is Beethoven. Ah, interesting. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I mean, ah, that's how that's how they would that's how they would summarize. That's really it. interesting. Yeah. That'll be a good thing to remember yeah. as I if, yeah. if I learn more or read more. Du Fu was a much more somber man. They knew each other. I think they met. No, they did. Spot. They did know each other. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't there yeah. Li Po as well? Yeah, Li Po mm-hmm. is Li Bai. Li Bai, same, okay. Same person. Oh, just, is yeah. that just different uh, yeah. romanization yeah. and then yeah. sort of gets yeah. corrupted yeah. a little That's bit? Yeah, the same, same guy. Yeah, okay. Du Fu. Uh, Manfredi had us read, uh, uh, Professor Manfredi had yeah. us read some some poetry in Mandarin yeah. in class. That was nice. I thought that was a good exercise. Yeah, yeah. Even if you didn't know all the words, just to get the sounds in your in your throat, you know, yeah. yeah, sort of learn the translation later or whatever. But anyway, we did the, the deer enclosure, I believe. Oh, okay. But yeah, probably a weird translation for wow. somewhere game lives. I'd say my f- <laughs> my favorite that I I, 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 or I could talk about this for a while, but my favorite translator of Chinese poetry was a New Zealand guy. You know the word gung ho. Mm, yeah. He's the one that started that. The uh-huh. gung-ho comes from, he founded these kids for, these schools for little boys yeah. to try to help them. And they, they would, gung-ho is what they were called. That uh-huh. was part of it. Anyway, that's the side. But he wrote, he, he, he translated, and he's, for me, reading. If you read a Chinese translated, it's just clumsy. I mean, it's, they tend to ta- have, make it rhyme and make it, you know, they, they try to fit the structure of Chinese language in English. Right. You can't do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he, and so one of the other p- people that he Translated was Bai Ju Yi, who was more like Li Bai and sort of playful. Okay. Yeah, I like the more playful poetry, I guess. I like Du Fu too, but sure. But Roe Alley was in New Zealand. He was he was he, you know, Sidney Rittenberg knew him. Oh. Mm. I said, I said, Sidney, did you know Roe Alley? I said, Oh yeah, you know he didn't know him well, but he did know him. Uh, he, yeah. His biographer, the biographer, he said the biographer of Roe Alley really treated him badly. He felt, but. Whatever. <laughs> anyway, that's all on the side. I mean, on this, like, there's, there's famous uh, over and over again in many different dynasties and many different contexts. There's well-known, studied um, examples of government reforms that mm-hmm. happen from time to time. One of them is called like the single whip reform, which I think is. Min- that's funny because that's a. That's a name of a move in the Tai Chi form. Seriously? Yeah, single whip. It's like it's oh, it's um, hmm. it's this one. What do you know? <laughs> okay. Uh. Uh, it was, well, it was a it was a reform of the currency because the uh, the context was uh, the Colombian exchange was going on, and all that silver through the Spanish Empire was flooding the world, uh, and specifically through the Philippines. Uh, which was Spanish control at that time, and lo and behold, the Chinese go down and they make a Chinatown, and <laughs> and they and they are selling a tremendous amount of Chinese-made goods to the Spanish for hard silver, and so the amount of silver in circulation in middle and late Ming Dynasty was increasing, mm-hmm. and so the single whip reform was this effort to uh, change the taxes from paying in copper or in barter. Because if you're a peasant, you sometimes paid in rice yeah. or millet. And he said, okay, now there's enough silver. I, this, this wasn't Wang Yang Ming. This was a guy before him. Uh, uh, they said, now we can just pay in silver. Everybody just, and, and it was tremendously successful for a while, but it, there were other aspects that didn't work. You know? And so we just must, and they thought about it. They debated it. They worked on it, and they made it happen. This is a very sophisticated system of administration that understands its own limitations mm. to a certain it, it, They're very 
nobody understands all of their limitations. Yeah. But they try. Yeah. You know, and here and this is happening in the 1500s. Yeah. You know, when it, it, feudalism is ending, you know, there's been the Renaissance. But you, would you rather live in Ming China or <laughs> feudal Europe if you're the average person? I'd, I'd take Ming China, obviously. I, <laughs> I, I suppose <laughs> if you're a member of the elite, of course, your answer might be different. I don't right. know, but. Uh, you know, let's go back to this idea. You talked about the intellectual, you know, the intellectual tradition being so strong, and we re yes. how they revere that. But the Cultural Revolution was completely against that. Anything from the past, anything. I mean, anything. Yeah. Uh, is the glasses thing real? They killed anybody with glasses. Yeah. Is that a real well, thing? Well, I don't think so. But I mean, I maybe. Or does it have any basis? Yeah, there was some. You know, like, just some like association with were, the intellectual. So teachers were like tortured and killed by their students. Man. Like these horrible mobs. Terrible things. I mean, it was terrible things. I mean, it was terrible. It was a catastrophe. And completely yeah. anti-intellectual. Any anti-past, anti anything, yeah. anything history. I mean, any, anything that... They looted and burned. It, and if there's things. anything that's more on Chinese than anything, it's the Cultural Revolution, yeah. it seems to me. Right, right. Yeah. I, I, obviously, I don't know. Yeah. You know. Uh, but to bring it into the context of was there a complete break in continuity in Chinese well, culture? I, I probably not. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't the, think so. The villages are still there. Yeah. The locals are, and they still have their sacred geography. Well, and they sure, but a lot of the of temples course. aren't there anymore. You're right. You yeah. know. But they mm -hmm. rebuilt them. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and and they have gone back to paying their admit, uh, intellectuals more and re revering them more. Part of that has to do with because they need them for the technology in they order do. to keep up. I mean, the, that's a large part of it yes. is really now we need, we know we need these professionals. And so education is valued. Teachers are paid a lot more now than they were. I have one friend who I said to him, he's really smart. I said, why did he just call me? He's a member of the party. He's a really good friend. Shall too. I? No, this is another oh. guy. Oh. This is another guy. And he finally, he got, he got a brain tumor and he had to retire early, which was great to him because he could read. <laughs> I mean, he could read. I bring, him, I bring him these big books of history, you know, from the, written in English. And he's, you know, that's not as, he reads them. But anyway, uh, he's the one that said, I, give me, I wish I had another 200 oh. years so I could understand what's going on, this sort of thing. Mm. Well, what was I going to say? Oh, I said, why didn't you get into academia? You know, why did you become an administrator? He became mm. a very high level administrator. And he said, because <laughs> they didn't get paid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, that, yeah. that was, he came of age during the Cultural Revolution. Wow. Yeah. Uh, wow. So, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, that was just so, I mean, it's very un-Chinese from what oh, you've wow. been saying. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess if you're coming of age during that time, you're not thinking, boy, I'd like to be a college professor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. I, would, I, I mean, don't know. The, the scale of the... I've, I've, I've listened to some lecture series in some detail about what it was like uh, for the other communist leaders during the, the Cultural Revolution yeah. and how, how Mao was just out of control yeah. and like why Mao did that. You know, he never swam across the Yangtze. Yeah. He bobbed along like a cork. Or, just, yeah, yeah. You know, I've whoa, seen whoa, the picture. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've actually been to that spot. Really? Yeah, oh, I've shit. been there. Oh, yeah. wow. But, and, and so they just, they have a, and this pre this predates communism but they have the, the leadership has a consensus based decision making culture where they, it's kind of here's a biological term quorum sensing yeah they they are extreme that's why they're so careful with their language yeah. and that's why you're not allowed to openly criticize the government yeah because they're extremely careful that they they understand that uh words matter <laughs> And we all need, we all got to jump at the same time. And so they have, it's, it's this, it's, this, it's a kabuki dance. It's, uh, they're extremely <laughs> careful to sense if changes are coming, we all need to be on the same page and have that consensus. They were like that even during the time of Mao, but Mao had so much charisma and kind of, and this, ooh, <laughs> this kind of cult-like status. Yeah. That he was at, part of the reason he did the Cultural Revolution was he felt he was being pushed out, mm -hmm. and there was like he sent a letter to the People's Daily that he wanted to be published, and they didn't publish it, and that made him very angry, and he felt he was getting 
and isolating. Um, and then so he unleashed the Red Guards, and he, you know, he didn't unleash them; he kind of created them almost, you know. No, the the the, the, the young folks. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he did it. He did it fairly spontaneously, and he kind of did it by himself. That's like he, what he, a move, dude. What a move. Yeah. Yes. I just like get all these teenagers yeah. rampaging through the countryside in your name. Well, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I mean, in his name. Uh, yeah. And there, there was like this this rally where some young girl. What are we doing? He did he he either took a red banner or she did it, uh, tied it on him, and he like praised her and all this and. And as the consensus builds among the leadership, it spreads out instantly to the whole country, you know. And and then there was so there was this catastrophe yeah. <laughs> called the Cultural Revolution, yeah. partly because of a power struggle in the highest ranks. And in this in this case, we can say a lot, perhaps it has to do with megalomania, yes, psychological he was. trait. He I was. mean, it really was. It's sort of like I think what's happening in our country, oh. a sort of a megalomaniac idea that I you know and. And you get these yeah. uh, people that don't pay much attention to evidence or history. That, that mass hysteria. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. I, I don't want to make this about. It's not a very kind. Not a very no, kind no, no, comparison. No, no. no I understand, to now, but, but I mean, <laughs> but I, but it is a megalomania. Yes. Uh, sure. And the people who actually believe that we are militarily, we have full military supremacy over everybody, they seriously believe that. Yeah. And they and some of them are genuinely willing to risk an apocalyptic yeah. military confrontation. Yeah. This is crazy, you know. Anyway, to China. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, so yeah the and the, and they and they kept engaging. They keep <laughs> they they have not been able to. I don't know of any other model that they have. For decision making at the highest level, a similar type of consensus, quorum sensing decision happened when uh, Deng Xiaoping decided to do the reform and opening up in mm -hmm. what 1978. Mm -hmm. He took this long railroad trip down to the south. He's an old man. You know, yeah. He's he's tottering at this point. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it's in the 80s. I think yeah, 70s. Uh, 70s. Yeah. Uh -huh. He had been purged twice by Mao. He had been imprisoned and all this, but now he's in charge Ooh. of China, and he goes to Guangdong and you know Pearl River Delta, and a, and the story is really quite amazing. Everybody was just kind of around him, knowing that he was making a big decision, and then he made a few public pronouncements to the radio. You know, this is the seventies uh, that we're going to have these special economic zones type thing. Shenzhen, and then. Hmm. And then, and so all these hard communists were like, okay, <laughs> we're going to have reform and opening up. You wow. know? But nobody could jump first. It's like yeah. penguins waiting on the edge and <laughs> there's oh, a right. leopard seal down the right, road. Nobody right. can go first. The yeah. leader has to do it first because yeah. otherwise they're in, you're in deep doo-doo. You can't just say, yeah. we need to change <laughs> hmm. as a lower level person. He's referred to Deng Xiaoping as the pragmatist, the great pragmatist, mm, right. as opposed to... Miles of Dome. Yeah. Who's referred to as? Well, the great you don't, if, Mao. I, I know some people that you, you couldn't use the words. But they, I would, wouldn't want to say it. In, right. You know, honestly. Yeah. Others, the uh, people that, you know, I, we've others, asked people. I've been there in China. Pictures asked people. still up in people's yeah. living rooms, yes. right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> he's, he's a myth. At this point. Well, he yeah. is, yeah. I mean, you ask if you ask people, "What do you think of Mao?" They'll always say, "Well, he did some good and did some bad," and that's no, about that's the answer you get. Enough. That's yeah. it. That's what you. That's the answer. That's you probably get. what Dung would say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's always. And I wish course. my watch worked. I bought for you know ten or twenty yuan in, this, <laughs> in Tiananmen Square, you know, yeah. Yeah. and it had Mao. The, the, it, oh no! His, shit. his hand waved on the second. Oh, click. <laughs> it was the uh, best. I still have it, but it doesn't work. Uh, I mean. yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean that, yeah, that was stuff's everywhere. A little red yeah. book you could buy yeah, everywhere, yeah. and the watches. Yeah. And there's a museum in Chengdu, probably the best museum in China, that, uh, with respect to modern history. Oh. That has a like the flying tigers thing, oh, a wow. lot of World War II stuff. Sure, sure. And uh -huh. even Chongqing. has, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. it's, it's in Chengdu. No, it's in Chengdu. Okay. Uh, the guy want he's a rich sheep. I guess I think he's made his money in development, but he has a thing on the earthquake. 
Oh. You know, that big earthquake, and you go in, and it's, it's heart-wrenching because they, he actually brought buildings in. You have to go through that. These things collapse, and you come out in this courtyard, and there's this, all this artwork by various artists about the earthquake. It, but in the center are all these children's backpacks oh. from the school, and he went oh. through a school. Okay, that's one thing. He has another thing on bound feet, and when you walk through, floor is uneven. Oh, no, yeah. But the most dramatic thing, the most dramatic thing, you go into this big room, dark, and it's all Chairman Mao clocks. Whoa. <laughs> it's just amazing. Jesus. I mean, I mean, this is something, you know, how, you know, he it's was able to do it. personal art installation. Yeah, I mean, but the clock is ticking. I mean, think about that. I mean, that yeah, it really makes you think. But Damn. I mean, so I mean, that's probably the I don't biggest. Know what to think about that's that. fun. Well, I mean, that would make you think, and it yeah. makes pe- Chinese people that go in there think. Yeah. You know, it's a and it's just this huge campus. And oh, I was going to say the statues that they have for the from the anti-Japanese war. They don't call it the Civil War. Yeah. The mm-hmm. anti-Japanese war. Yeah. Chiang Kai-shek is out there with yeah. Chairman Mao sure. in wow. the statues. He's got all of these. You know, wow. there's, it's really an interesting united movie. once again. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, it's it's funny, but uh, I mean, Chiang Kai Shek was allied with the Nazis for a while. Yeah, was he? <laughs> he was. He was before the Nazi switched to helping Japan. Mm. Like he 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 got a lot of uh, military advice from Nazis in the 1930s before Japan invaded. You know, it's it, it's it, it's imp- Here we are, Westerners discussing China and. The elephant in the room is this anti-Chinese hysteria that we have, and uh, sometimes I'm afraid I I go the other way too far as yeah. if they're magic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've I've have the same worry of yeah. sort of orient and, orientalism. And they're not. You know. yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. not magic. No, yeah. they're not. Uh, and they have plenty of problems, and they Our, have yeah. uh, plenty of flaws. Admitted it, cynophiles here. Yeah. But that's the first step is admitting. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so it's yeah, and so it's just terribly important to realize like it's it's like Americans with the uh, the Cold War anti-Russian hysteria, yeah. you know, like Russia is not magic, yeah, uh, but they are also not our enemy, yeah. And it was and the Cold War was a catastrophe. Yeah. And speaking of mass hysteria, I fear sometimes when I they talk about the rise of China and all this other shit. You want China to rise. Yeah. The rise of China is good for America. Yeah. <laughs> they are not our enemy. Yeah. They are a competitor and a rival, but you, a friendly yeah. competitor. Yeah. And, and so, you know, yeah, we, we go, uh, communism bad, <laughs> Ch- Chinese central government bad, doesn't accept criticism what about our own mass hysteria yeah. and what about our own you know yeah. like we we are in deeper trouble yeah, mean, meanwhile chelsea manning's rotting in solitary confinement Julie, somewhere yeah. you know julian assange yeah. should be uh, a public figure <laughs> and a national hero yeah. not uh yeah i i don't i don't know if we did this last time or not but it's just like you said the hysteria or the stories we tell They're the fascists, but we have more people in jail. Than, yes. You know, like yes. they've what got are, one one of five people on the planet is Chinese, right? Right. Yeah. And we somehow managed to put more people in cages than they do, yeah. but they're the fascists. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It seems sort of playing on its face. I mean, don't, you know. Of course. Don't imprison dissidents. You know, don't do that. That's right. bad. Um but to to pretend that we're yeah we're a colonial <laughs> that our hands are clean we are a racist colonial society and some pe- when you when you hear some people talk about what they want china to do i think what they really want is china not to exist <laughs> i swear yeah. it's like do you do you honestly expect them to not act in their own self interest <laughs> yeah. Do you ex- what do you expect them to do? Like I don't even think you could really define it, but they're sitting there. They're stealing our trade secrets, even if they are. Good for them. Yeah, it makes sense. Defend your own trade secrets better than if 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 your trade secrets are if your if your intellectual property is so precious, why don't you defend it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they, and what are they stealing? 
Yeah. I'd ask you. <laughs> yeah, I, schematics for <laughs> airplanes. What you fucking do? Well, they talk. I get they, you know. You hear Those the are term, just gonna crash the. Yeah. Plane, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, they, you hear the term reverse engineering that they yeah. take this stuff and take it apart. Well. Yeah. I, you know. I mean. Of course they are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're putting it together. They don't even have to take it apart. <laughs> oh, yeah. So here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, Deng, Deng Xiaoping, Brother Deng, you know, the little bottle. <laughs> uh, he said China has, the Middle East has oil. China has rare earth. And they very cleverly and with extreme discipline in the 90s, well, starting in the 80s, uh, drove international prices of rare earth elements, things like dysprosium, neodymium, stuff like that, so low that they drove everybody else out of business. And then they restricted the export of raw rare earths from China. It is illegal to export rare what? earth elements from China. They devalued it enough that it couldn't be profitable for other people yes. to be competitors. France and the United States in before the 1980s what supplied a 100%. What a move. Dude, yeah. they Jeez. know what the fuck they're doing. Yeah. They have more levers of economics yeah. and military and technology and state financial and monetary. They are the most powerful government and the most competent government ever created by any group of human beings that has ever existed. Yeah. I'm not joking. Yeah. Like the Ro the Roman government was powerful, but they didn't understand inflation. Yeah. They really did and so they would always be devaluing their currency and they'd fuck up the economy. What, how did this happen? We don't know. It was, an, it was literally unknown. Yeah. You know? It was a... Uh, China, uh, the, there will eventually probably be a government more competent and powerful than the one in Beijing right now, but I have yet to see it. And yeah. I'm working on trying to imagine what that's like. So they monopolized the rare earth element industry. And now they supply basically 90 to 100% of the world. But if you want to build, oh, I don't know, recording equipment or a microphone, you have to have, you have the to first invent the universe. Sorry, that's a, that's a Carl Sagan <laughs> reference. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> if you wish to make uh, but, uh, you have to not only go to China to get the rare earth elements, they have to build it for you. Yeah. Well, what do you want built? I want a microphone built. Well, what do you want? Oh, God, here's the blueprint. <gasps> all of it and so there are individuals americans who look at this and go wait a minute what about military components what about components in our if you need a neodymium magnet for your fancy drone because you want to go murder people in yemen kids <laughs> uh where do you get that component because I you bet. can't get it in the united states you get it from china yeah. China is our military supplier. Yeah. Do you think we're going to fight any wars that they don't want us to fight? Who? It is the servant who takes money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And so this dude, I can show you the video. He has put together a PowerPoint presentation of, like, weapon system after weapon systems, tanks, airplanes, drones, guided missile systems, military satellites, aircraft carriers all these other things and he just lists out the parts like just here's the seven parts in this one drone that all come from china here's the 16 parts of the in this uh huh. f-35 jet the 1.5 trillion dollar weapon system that we spent that, yeah. doesn't, that doesn't work in the rain <laughs> it doesn't work in the rain it doesn't work in the rain and every single component in it that's made with rare earth elements came from china and they know how to build it yeah not that you'd want to. You wouldn't want to. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. So here and and another I the second most astonishing part of this rare earth element story is part of the reason it's more expensive to mine rare earth elements in the West, let's call it that the United States, Canada, France, is our regulatory system. Okay, just let me back up. In the ground, rare earth elements are often associated with thorium and uranium. And so it's classified as a radioactive material, and also it's, and it's treated as if it was weapons grade. 
as as if it was a a source of atomic weapon, right? <laughs> Nuclear weapon. Uh-huh. And so it's much more expensive to deal with it. Whereas in China, they don't worry about that. And things like uranium and thorium are... That's funny. I've been wondering all day. I can't remember what we Molten talked Soviet. about, maybe what we were going to talk about, but yeah. you brought it around. I did. I did. <laughs> Took me 50 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> you brought it around. So this molten salt reactor, uh, when they mine their rare earth elements, they are also mining for the fuel for their future molten salt reactor. Let's just Holy say that. crap. Yeah. And in the West, our regulatory environment goes, oh no, thorium. Ah! It's going to cost you so much more to get your rare earth element industry going again. You would almost have to invent from the ground up an independent industrial supply chain, independent from China. You would have to spend all that money to do that. And after 10 years, you'd be able to go, hey, world, we're making microchips again. We're making neodymium magnets again. We're not very good at it. We're not very good so at it. So we can't compete. <laughs> and it's twice as expe- yeah, and it's yeah. still twice as expensive as what's coming out of China. <laughs> right. um, that is the only way I can imagine us breaking their monopoly. Yeah. It's astonishing. Yeah. They have bound Japan to themselves. They have bound South Korea. South Korea, sure. They have bound Finland and Germany and Sweden. <laughs> and the United States. Think about this. Yeah. The Middle Kingdom. Yeah. The center of the world. <laughs> All the world's industrial economies revolve around their rare earth element industry. I'm still loving the whole sort of simultaneous Dong is thorium. A economic genius. <laughs> he is the Alexander the Great of the of the modern technological age it is astonishing yeah. how do you, because they have the monopoly now it leverages them into seven trillion dollars worth of uh intellectual property they know it they, they have that intellectual property yeah. if they choose to use it how do you get how expensive is it for the rest of the world to get around them and do you really think that if they detected somebody making that move like russia that they wouldn't also move you got to move when I move <laughs> to quote the movie heat, you know, yeah. like a criminal, like if the United States went, Oh shit. And, tr- and started and just jump started a rare earth. L- 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 they would also change their policy. Yeah. This is like a, you know, a Kung Fu battle and we're not very good at Kung Fu. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the joke at the end. There. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I like it. Well, yeah. I was trying to think. I can't remember if there's a, some sort of go proverb where like it, it's nice when a stone does two things at once, right? Yeah. And just thinking about the thorium with the rare yes. earth mining. Yeah. Holy yeah. crap. Yeah. Thor- thorium. I can't is, remember if that is actually yeah, a go proverb. But I mean, not. yeah, it's doing double. D- thorium is not water soluble. It doesn't bioaccumulate. It's a very good fuel for a molten salt reactor. It's not good for weapons. It, so they just... They, I mean, you could, if, if I had a block of thorium, it's also a alpha, it's a low level alpha radiation emitter, which means skin can stop that. It's not gamma ray. What's if there one? was a block of thorium right here, we would be fine. Yeah. I would, I would not feel guilty of jeopardizing your health. If there was, if it was another type of radioactive element, like a plutonium or something, we would have to run away. Yeah. You know, what's, I, I, I always, I, I tried to remind remind myself of this on more than one occasion but the alpha beta gamma right you know alpha like is a helium nucleus right two protons two neutrons right 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 beta right. is an electron uh just an electron just an electron so but what we call energetic one. we call energetic electrons that re- radiating from a specific spot we call that beta radiation if it comes from a radioactive decay yes. right, yeah. right, right, right 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 i think yeah. i think that's what happens when a neutron turns into a proton. And you said the alpha, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the alpha radiation, that's just the nucleus. It doesn't have... A, a helium nucleus. Yeah, yeah, so it's a... No electrons. Right. Does that make it an ion? Yeah, it's ionic. Yeah, yeah. 
And then gamma rays are, uh, it's a photon at extremely high level. Yeah, level. photons don't even exist, dude. <laughs> this guy. Oh. So, yeah, it, uh, so not only do they have this rare earth element monopoly. We went to physics later. I they guess. are the, the same, the people who are really looking at this, I sent out the email to you guys. They are maybe six months away from a demonstration react Ooh. of a molten salt reactor. Yeah. If we got to get there. Okay, the ribbon it's, cutting. It's That'll be January fun. It's January 2nd, 2020. I know I'm a collapsitarian. You know where your children are. I know I've got bags of lentils in case there's a... <laughs> collapsitarian. Uh, but if they really... I've been saying he was a contrary in this whole time. Right. If they start really rolling this out in the way that people much better informed than me think they can, I will change my tune. Yeah. You'll have to dick up your... Never mind. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, what's but, got me wondering now is when will collapsitarianism break into sex? <laughs> I mean, it happens to every oh, group. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. It's sort Which of a joke, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think I, the, uh, I mean, you see it happening with a lot of right-wing people who realize they can't control the world anymore. Yeah. And there, and a lot of them want to just go into the woods, yeah. like good with their guns. Bye, and... yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Well, yeah. you know, we were talking about, you know, sleeping in coffins. And, yeah. And, right. Yeah, yeah. I, and I've thought, I've realized, you know, I. We've been having conversations like these for a long time, yeah. and I've never been sure whether I. I'm 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 in a superposition of believing you and not believing you at sure. all times. I'm that way. But if I really believed you, wouldn't I be hoarding lentils too? Wow. You know, yeah. it's just easier to go to, even though you hate you hate to do it. But it's just easier to fucking pay your taxes and go to work. Yeah. You know, yeah. and whatever. I, I I'm that way most of the time. Right. Because it's like. <laughs> It's like being in Australia right now and going, well, I see a lot of smoke, but it's, it's very the, inconvenient it's, to run now. People uh, always run when it's too late, yeah. you know, and so it's I, uh, not to get back to the Internet, but it's the dog with the this is fine. Yeah. He's yeah. in a burning room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, well, what's so funny yeah, is yeah. you said that you're you're both at the same time or something. I mean, the debate in physics is is electron a particle or wave or is it both? Yeah. I mean, that's really. Yeah, that's the debate. Yeah. Well, and. Yeah. and so you're both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and and that's I I did at my as soon as I bought this house, I I went to myself. Am I going to take this seriously, or am I just somebody who likes to be that guy at the party? Yeah. You know? <laughs> a little, little soul searching. Yeah. No. Well, because like most people don't understand the oil, coal, natural gas situation. Like it's depleting very rapidly mm -hmm. and. Whether the molten salt reactor gets rolled out or not, we are going to live through the end of the fossil fuel age, yeah. one way or another. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, that's why I started. So your optimist is with the molten, molten fuel. Okay, so yeah. civilization has metabolic requirements, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Whether it be wheat or whether it be... Rice or whether it be... Energy. Yeah. And energy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... So uh, when those metabolic requirements are not met, yeah. Whew. and he's talking about the basic metabolic requirements, oh, not the stuff for high speed running or yeah. we're talking about, you know, you have a basal metabolic rate. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's just what your maintenance. Yeah. Right. And he, he, that's even threatened. That's not like, the that's one not for, necessarily for a high playing style. ping pong or. Yeah. No, yeah. most uh, of your, most of your body's energy actually goes to maintaining chemical gradients. Right. Making sure the sodium is on the Because then you side. have a ramp. Yep. Or you can do something with yeah. it. Yeah, it's like 70%, I think, of yeah. your ATP is just used yeah. to, like... Run those sodium-potassium pumps. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. all I remember, yeah. guys. Well, right, but yeah. that's your nerves. <laughs> that, you know, all that... Just think of how much work goes in your body just to make a fucking word. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Incredible. So... Poof, I waste a lot of energy blabbing. Yeah, so... Oof. I think, I mean, we, we talk about war. It, 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 maybe war is one economy eating another that's why you have a war but if you're in the position of china and you're going wait a minute somebody who stupidly decided to fight with me is the most vulnerable country in the world the most vulnerable society 
if the oil runs out, it's like a bomb going off in every house in slow motion. Mm. It's like a bomb going off on every bridge in slow motion because mm. you can't maintain that bridge. Mm. Right. Rust never rests. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Time will make a fool of us all. Yeah. Your wastewater treatment shuts down. Right. Your water treatment for drinking water shuts down. Yeah. People start dying of dysentery. Termites are eating my lumber, but I can't call the, the guy or whatever. How do you, how yeah. do you make chemicals? Yeah. How do you make, how do you make uh, soap if there's no fossil fuel? Well, how do you get food to the table when it's all yeah. being raised in California or That's the Midwest right. or whatever? Yeah. I mean. Right, which is one of the things that makes me wonder, you know, if I really bought in... Man, I should figure it out. <laughs> I have the same problem. You know, actually. why don't I? I don't have birds yet. Yeah. It drives you know? me nuts because people go, "Oh, what can we do?" And I'm like, <laughs> it's... "Look at my farm." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but it's that's how that's a, it's a, even though they ask a maybe in semi good faith, that's a hard answer to get. Mm -hmm. What do you mean, look at your farm? I live in hilltop yeah, yeah. No. so fuck off with yeah. that that's yeah. what i should do you know I don't, I don't, and, and a lot of the a lot of the cultures that could survive the, uh, this situation yeah. are ones that live closer to the earth but they're also the ones that are most threatened by climate change yeah yeah you go to the north you go to the oceania yeah and places like that and i mean they really are but you start thinking you know but you cannot have seven billion people living a sustaining themselves i mean try to imagine in washington just the number of people we have we don't have a high density no. trying to live off the land in washington it, it's it's <laughs> so my turn you know because i have four grandkids and i said i don't want to you know here i want i want them to be happy that's what i want to do keep them right. happy right. i really do i mean even the older ones i'll tell them i wouldn't have kids and stuff like that but <laughs> Adam's got me thinking, well, maybe I've got some extra money. Maybe I should just go get $10,000 worth of silver coins and yeah, bury them in the I'm ground and tell the grandkids thing. where they are. You understand? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it's sort of this. Uh, well, I, I mean, it's not. Collapse is a lifestyle. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how else you, to say You've it. made it more of a lifestyle brand. Adam. Sure. Yeah, okay. But like. It's not one thing you do and then it stops, you know? No. And so you're living in this part of the world. You're aware of Cascadia. You're aware that we're all in this together. I, I went to, I, I saw something that made me really happy the other day. It was on the, the generic homepage of my Google, you know, and, and they have news articles. And it had a picture of downtown Tacoma right next to like a picture of somewhere else, you know, like Russia. So it's just generic. And it said it might be one of, our area might be one of the more racially harmonized in the United States. Yeah. Because, partly because of the military base, yeah. and partly because the, the sheer number of different immigrants in the area. And I yeah. thought, and like it actually seems to be working towards post racial, because it's not even a dichotomy at this point. Like I went to that pho route, I walked to it. And the other day, I heard like four different languages. Yeah, no. Just in, and this is not this is not the international district. Right. No. You're not. I mean, even you're not in like, little whatever. Yeah. yeah. Even places like Kent. Yeah. Have more non-whites now apparently yeah. than whites. Yeah. And and I think Franklin Pierce School District is the most diverse school district in the country. I remember going to a yeah. when one of my older grandsons something it was a concert that they had, but the principal from Franklin Pierce was there. Mm -hmm. I think it was, and he said that it's the most nice. eth ethnically diverse school district in the country. Yeah. This is a very positive thing. It is a very Be positive. Because, because white supremacists have had the Pacific Northwest in their crosshairs for a while. Some have called it the great white homeland. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, Oregon has a big... Yeah. Well, Eastern of, Oregon and Idaho. Yeah. Yes, mean, it does. Oh, yeah. Yes, it does. And, and Eastern Washington. I think about that, and I think about the context of Cascadia. And let's say it's a hard landing. Let's say it really is like, oh, shit, there's not enough oil. The economy is just stuck in this downward yeah. collapse, and people are getting very afraid. Yeah. Okay? Well... Let's let's meet those white supremacists at the bottom, so to speak. Like, hey, your great white homeland happens to be the most racially diverse corner of the United States. Great. Fuck yes. 
<laughs> that is awesome. They're sitting there like, ha ha, now the oil's gone and we're going to set up in our compounds. No, you're not. No, you're not. Yeah. A racially diverse army speaking 15 different languages of Cascadians waving a Cascadian flag. They're not going to storm your compound. But with Esperanto is the official Sure, language. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, yeah, you know, like that's... Because we are all in this together. Yeah. And there is only one planet. And there is not enough oil to support our lifestyle, even at this level, for very much longer at all. Yeah. I mean, some of the estimates, the fracking is probably going to be... There's a long tail end of oil exploration where it's like, Hey, we're making ten barrels a day. What do you fucking do? Yeah. You know, uh, I don't know a lot. Twenty twenty ten is not a very large number. No, <laughs> not a, if the well costs ten million dollars or thirty million dollars to drill, and the price of oil is a hundred dollars a barrel. Ten barrels a day doesn't go very far towards paying the interest payment. It's a bust. It's a Ponzi scheme. And yeah. it's ending right now. And meanwhile, you have to use energy to convert that oil and yes. to transport that the product of that. Which means the net energy is, is yeah. almost nothing. Yeah, it, yeah maybe, you, maybe you get 5% return of yeah. net yeah. energy. It's not enough. It's well, not. if we put, set up enough of those um, sort of uh, uh, dynamo generator uh, discotheques with people on exercise <laughs> bikes... Right. Right? Then yeah. we'll use that energy <laughs> to do the conversion, yeah. at least. Yeah. 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 And that's called the end of civilization. That's, that's what living <laughs> that's off what the land like. is. Yeah. That is. Subsistence societies are incredibly efficient. Yeah. <laughs> they are. Like they leave. Everything's done by hand. <laughs> yeah. Damn, it sucks, though. <laughs> yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. But I thought. I thought efficiency looked like industry because of the marginal right. cost of producing the next thing and also specialization. I thought that was efficient. It can't. Huh? It, it can, it's a different kind of efficiency. Yeah. It really is. It gets you both. It, what matters is the delta. You talked about uh, the, the slope, the ramp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, you know, chemical gradient or whatever. Chemical gradient. That's what matters. You can either have extreme efficiency, which means here's your base level at zero, a line. But now your chemical process, your a metabolic process, a mutation in your genes lets you do something more efficiently. It used to take me five to make one. Now it only takes me two to make one. Mm -hmm. Boom. There's your delta. Mm -hmm. And you can now use that extra energy to go do something else. Or you can have the exact same level of efficiency. Here's your zero. But now you have an energy source. It still takes me five to make one. But I just found a big bucket that has a hundred of yeah. whatever it is mm -hmm. to make one. Well, that's another delta, right? Mm. So, let's take this back to China. Ooh. They are a land-based ancient people that when you have just rule and if you have uh, consistent laws and a consistent culture and markets and roads and... Uh, uh, a legal system that everybody understands. It's not a chaotic environment. Pre-industrially, the economy stacks up. It fills up all those lower levels. People move from their forts, their, their fortified compounds, down into the plains, closer to the, the fields where they work. They find markets for shoes and rice and salt. And Paper. All this Paper, all this other stuff. It stacks up. It fills up. There's no inefficient, there's no vacant space in that lower economy. Truly, uh, so it fills it, up China, from the bottom. It's... It fills from the bottom to the top, you know, from the lowest peasant to the son of heaven. It really does, and and so you have these periods where, like, China breaks apart. The Mongols invade, forty million people dead. There's a lot of empty space and land. There's a lot of empty farms. Mm. He was drafted and he went north and he got killed by a Mongol. That land is untilled. It's it's fallow. Mm. It, it, and then, but then uh, they kicked the Mongols out peace and justice and order is maintained and what happens the account the population just starts to expand it's incredible at the beginning of the ming dynasty it might have been two 150 million people by the end of the ming dynasty or the middle of the ming dynasty 300 million 400 million a lot well, of that's what we're working with now right yeah yeah 
well, that a lot of that has to do with the maize and the yeah, yes, like it potatoes. Does. Coming potatoes, in. If the maize and potatoes mm-hmm. coming and in. Potatoes. Well, they came from the New World to pop because then they could start oh, growing on the hillsides out beyond the rice yes. and so the those wheat. Were, those yes. were imports that yes. turned yeah. into staples. Columbia sure. Exchange, yes. Yeah. Okay, because Col- isn't there a, isn't there a peanuts. five uh, like a five grain or five crop, you know, one of these groups of numbers? I can't remember what it is. What potatoes, you? rice, blah blah blah. There's a like, list like of five or something. Yeah. Sources of carbohydrate. I think so. Yeah, it's like rice, wheat. Corn, potato, I don't know, barley. But so what was it? So the That's Colombian not. exchange, well, they, got, well, once, they got sweet potato yes. and... Well, they got the, the potatoes, corn, especially huh. those. And yeah. then that's what made the difference. Yeah, interesting. Just they, like potatoes in Ireland. They hit their upper ecological limit with the crops that they had. Yeah. And then potatoes. Wow. And then corn. Beans, runner beans, the pole beans. Those oh, yeah. are new world. Peanuts. The world's largest Ooh. grower of peanut is... China. They're I also the world's largest consumer of them. They I love, love a peanut. Yeah, Szechuan food, man. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Kung Pao chicken. It's excellent. Yeah. And, and so, okay, so it... But what about the stacked, cashews? Ca- cashews are a tree crop. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> well, you <laughs> saying just, words. <laughs> oh, I like a good cashew yeah, chicken good every yeah. once in a while. Yeah, cashews suck. It, 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 but okay, so that economy stacks up and it fills up until they reach ecological limits again. Right? Thirty percent of the modern Chinese population, which is how many people? A lot. <laughs> are subsistence farmers. Yeah. There's your source of labor, wow. cheap labor. It's also a source of stability. There's nobody who likes stability more. Yeah. Than a subsistence farmer. Yeah. How how does that relate? Thirty percent. Wow. How does that relate to the sort of, I don't know, modern last decade or three i don't know how long it's been going on trend of the sort of migration right. from the rural to the urban yes. centers yes it, it and it has like uh, uh the largest human migration ever is from the countryside to the cities in china right. in the past 50 years and i've seen it <laughs> yeah they have those empty villages they call it now wow it's grandparents and grandkids yeah wow and, and all these all these and workers that went to tail off washing windows or something trying to send money back to that's the it that's yeah. it yeah, and, you know, for they, grandma and grandma yeah, and they do they build yeah. houses they come home build houses holy they, crap they, i mean like these two stories i mean i saw a lot of these in the countryside they come home and they build a house for their parents yeah or grandparents they barely know their kids they yeah. see them once or twice oh. a year it's terrible yeah. it, it's a real problem and they recognize it yeah but uh, so overall like zooming out on china they have that incredible population with stability it's fairly conservative there's not going to be a revolution starting from the countryside for a while in China. You could say that the communists are there because of a revolution in the countryside. That's what Mao said. That is Maoism. He said, "There's this wave coming. We can either ride it or we can be overwhelmed by it." Well, that was, was sort right. of that was sort of Mao's innovation on Marxism, Marxism. Yes. right? Was yeah. like it's not the proletariat, it's not right? It's the farmers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. is yeah. Maoism. That was yes. his, right. And they remember that, okay? Yes. And so they think. They think about their own countryside in a way that we can't, our elites don't even. They call it the flyover. Yeah. They call it flyover states. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> That's your backbone. Yeah. If you don't have, if you don't have a large number of peasant farmers working the land, you don't have a country. You yeah. don't have a society. They are the basis of your society. They have, okay, so China has that in terms of efficiency. They are working their land by hand. Now they're going to have this molten salt reactor churning out. You, you can make one a day. You can make three a day in a shipyard. Right? Yeah. These are 250 even megawatt got the- reactors. These are 1,000 <laughs> megawatt reactors that you have to refuel with. the. If you have a coal-fired plant, you have to move 9,000 tons it's, it, of coal a day to keep a thousand megawatt reactor going. How many, how much mass of thorium or uranium or plutonium do you have to refuel a day for a molten salt reactor? Mm-hmm. Three kilograms. You can carry it. You could have it. You could put it in your pockets. You could, it could be, the, it could be an honorable thing that goes to a different person every day. <laughs> some, some young, some young 25 year old, you know, with a lot of testosterone on a motorbike be like, today, is your day to refuel the city of Shanghai. <laughs> you will go down the street in a thing of honor, you know, carrying on your bike, your motorcycle, <laughs> a lump of thorium that you then take and, you know, we 
melt it down into the salt. So that they have the efficiency. Don't trip, of, but actually, if you do, if you, it's still fine. Yeah, it's yeah. still fine. You can't break it. You can't break it. Now that so they have that stack, they have that stacked up economy of an ancient, back to the Bronze Age civilization, peasant farmers working the land who love their land. Now they're gonna have <laughs> this incredible. They get both. They're getting yeah. both. It's astonishing. Now they're gonna have electricity so cheap it could be essentially free. Yeah. What happens to the cost of iron if the if the energy cost of smelting is zero? You start with the heavy industry and you say, hey, we're, today is the day that we your electric bill comes to zero. Yeah. Plastic, paint, yeah. paper, cloth. And then you work it down the food chain until finally the citizens all have free electricity as well, even at the final consumer. So the contrast to me, it seems between that culture and this culture is, and this is what gives me hope, is that the Chinese are anticipating much more into the future rather than bottom line that the oil companies and the gas line companies, they're only think in the short term, the really short they term. They have to. Yeah. I mean, that's, well, that's the way the system runs. It's our system. Yeah. And that system of thinking of this year's profit how much or uh, even next quarter even next quarter my competitor and and when the when the when the farm when even the profits from the farms are going to stockholders yeah uh and that's you know i mean i mean so that's the difference i mean that's the fundamental difference between the two systems ask yourself how many how many gallons of fossil fuel go into every bushel of wheat grown in the united states it's got to be some average number. You could do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How many barrels of oil go into a bushel of rice grown by a peasant farmer in China? Yeah. You can't win against that. Yeah. But you, you're we making the claim that you said 30% of their population is directly involved in agriculture. Right, but you're making the distinction between sort of our modern semi-industrial yes. agriculture. Yes. And you're saying that's not what they're doing. You're saying they're doing... Okay, okay, yes. Uh, it, it, in context, yeah, they are industrializing their agriculture. Right. They are in the process they of... They use doing, tractors. They use tractors and okay. road tillers. But yeah. because they are an ancient civilization, some of those villages are millennia old. It's like, we've been farming the Sichuan Basin since the fall of the Mongols. You know, right. This village has been stuck here on this hillside it, since, I don't know. And the people, the grandchildren of people that moved out of the village still go back to the village to yes. honor, honor their ancestors. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And they'll and they'll still say that that's where they're from even if they've never lived there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this when I went to when I was in Guangzhou, this friend that I'd met at PLU in the 80s, was like, let's go and he, we went to his ancestral village. It was a long trip and sure. you know, and then but that's he just thought that was the thing to show to me. It was, you know, it's going through a lot of heavy industry and yeah. stuff like that and what but to him that was an exciting thing to bring this honorable sure. guest. Sure. You yeah. know? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Took me a while to realize that. But Yeah, they and like they'll in the From the Soil book, which I've read, it, it talk it's up the it talks about that. They they'll, they'll still keep their, their name. And the uh is it the Christmas festival where everybody goes back home? Yeah. It's like the largest it's not singles day. <laughs> That's like eleven something. But uh, it's like the largest. It's Chinese New Year's. Chinese what, New Year's when you yeah, go back home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you do not want to travel in China at that time. No, it's dangerous. Yeah. I mean, if you go on the trains, I mean, I mean, dangerous. Yeah. You just do not travel because every, they let all everybody onto the trains. I mean, maybe it's not quite like they have more faster trains and yeah. stuff. But, but I mean, I did it one time in Zugong, and I literally, the crowd rushed out to the train. And we were headed back to Chengdu from Zagong, this place. And and we, we have the turnstiles where it goes like this in order to, you know, oh, yeah. hooked. So you, you get trapped if you're pushed. And this woman, this little woman was in front of me. I had to struggle to push back and lift her over. Yeah. I don't know where I got the strength. Yeah. I mean, honest God, it was the scariest. I was I probably <laughs> involving people. It's the scariest situation I've ever been. I've been close to bears, wolves, lions, and stuff like oh, that. Man. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, for for I mean, it was scary. Oh, anyway, yeah. just I think it's the you trigger largest, our memory. It's yeah, yeah. the yeah. largest movement of people. I think, like in any one day, is the is, is the is the like tomb sweeping 
day yeah. is that part of the, yeah. the Lunar I New Year so. festival? I think it is too. Yeah. 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 And, and you burn the hell money. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 or hell iPads. Yeah, or, I love that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And another practical piece of advice: don't fly to China during that time because it's yeah. three times as expensive as mm-hmm. going some other time because right. the demand is so high. Don't yeah. fly next in January. <laughs> really, don't. Sure. Yeah. So there. I want to. I, yeah, I was planning on uh, taking a slow boat. <laughs> to go in March, it's yeah. cheap to fly. Okay. <laughs> Everybody's yeah. I don't want to travel. Yeah. So they they've got that. How is it that? all the benefits of industrialization and all the benefits of fossil fuels have turned into a nightmare for us, for humanity, right? Because it answers, if you're, if you're a pre-industrial person, life is hard, you know, you, oh, yeah. you get a toothache and you might die. Yeah. You step on a rusty nail yeah. and your life ends yeah. because... And also, <laughs> nails are hard to make. Nails are hard to, to make. make. Yeah. Everything is made by... And here we are, look, and we go, okay, so we answered all the, all the agonies and ecstasies of an Iron Age or a, or a Renaissance-type civilization. We have that now, yeah. you know? A rusty nail is not the end of your life. Yeah. And it's turning into a nightmare. Yeah. Right? Well, how is it Maybe we should also ask why would a colonial society approach industrialization in that way, where you have levels of wealth accumulation financially that are monstrous in a world of horrifying poverty? And why would an ancient (laughs) non-colonial, stretching back to the Bronze Age society, be able to look at industrialization and the benefits of fossil fuels and and have a different answer one that does not create monsters well yeah that's a that question assumes that it's our the modern world is the western world isn't it it's our creation isn't it 600 years 600 years of of european dominance yeah sure it's coming to an end but what did it do yeah. Ooh. When you say that, you know, I think I think I mentioned last time we got together that I'm the first one in my lineage to have running water and yeah. and a toilet and hot water at birth. I think I did. I'm, I'm pretty yeah. sure. I'm not sure it was a house in Cripple Creek, Colorado, but I can remember an ice box, uh, no refrigerator. But yeah. I mean, it, you know, I think I'm the first one that's had that. I mean, I can get up and walk ten feet to the bathroom, flush the toilet, and yeah. but I could be the last, not just the first, but the last from collapse. birth to death. Seriously, my That's kids even little, may not have that. Just a little, no, there, little I mean, blink. Uh, like e- anybody who, I, Isaac Asimov, uh, M. King Hubbard, among others, they all you have to do is really look at the amount of fossil fuel, look at the metabolic requirements of modern civilization, and do the math. It's a, it sounds like a pretty simple piece of I think arithmetic. I really. honestly, it, I think. People who are peak oil deniers, uh, the definition of denial is that you know it's actually true, right? That's the definition of denial. It's something you know is true, but you're saying it isn't. They know. I think everybody kind of knows, and they're looking at it like, oh, shit. (laughs) I I mean, think of it this way. If China starts producing these molten salt reactors as fast as they could and using that basically give them out for free to, to everywhere you know uh, uh the, the next great I, I don't even want to say the word frontier but i have to say it because we are a frontier colonial society and this is racist and it's a racist worldview but the next frontier is a, a sub-saharan africa you know to to to, to develop and help them develop and China is going to do it before us, but they could start just giving these reactors away. And if they do that, they will have essentially saved human civilization yeah. from a mass extinction dark age. Woo. It's just astounding. You could one out of 10, you could say, okay, every 10th reactor is just going to scrub CO2 out of the atmosphere. 
chemically bind it to certain types yeah. of rocks or whatever. Yeah. Just running 24-7. Every day you pour in about a gallon of <laughs> 700 degree molten yeah. salt with thorium. I, I can only say I hope you're right. I hope I am too. <laughs> yeah, I really, really. I didn't, I mean, 10 years ago, I did not know about this reaction. Yeah, yeah. I hope it's, I hope it works. Well, we made it. We made it to your thorium. We did. Somehow. Yeah. Even though we started in Elam. <laughs> yeah. We talked about Lee Bai and yeah. <laughs> it's been Oliver Goldsmith. Give me yeah. a break. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Satire. <laughs> That's a good spot to end. Yeah. Sure.